Welcome to Front and Center, from political battlefields to cooperative playing fields. Hello, I'm Michael Maxeni. Today, my partner Steve and I are opening another extremely important door so that we can answer the question, how do we get government on the side of the people? Today, we have invited Mark Crispin Miller to discuss an important topic, a crucial topic, propaganda. Now, I'd like to ask, though, my partner, Steve Berriman, to introduce our distinguished guest, a man Steve has known for many years. Steve. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. I'm very pleased to welcome our guest, Mark Crispin Miller. He's author, professor, uncommentator, voice in the bewilderness. He's the author of many books. Uh, first one, Boxed In, The Culture of TV, The Bush Dyslexicon, Observations on a National Disorder, Cruel and Unusual, Bush, Cheney's New World Order, Fooled Again, How the Right Stole the 2004 Election, and Why They'll Steal the Next One, Unless We Stop Them, and Loser Take All, Election Fraud and the Subversion of Democracy. He also wrote the introduction to the 2004 version of Edward Bernays' book on propaganda. We'll talk about that later. And for decades has been a professor of media, culture, and communication at NYU. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Well, you know, I've known you for a number of years. I first met you, I think it was in 2005, uh, when you came to Sonoma County uh, promoting your book, which was new at that time, about the stolen election, Fooled Again. <clears throat> Up until that time, uh, I would say, Mark, you were able to pass as a mainstream academic. I believe you even wrote op-eds for the New York Times. Uh, so uh, we want to find out about your passage, your changes, before we get into our deeper conversation about propaganda. Tell us a bit about your journey from mainstream to outlying truth teller, and particularly how the book uh, Fooled Again came about. Okay, uh, as you note, um, I, was, I was a voice permissible in polite society, uh, although I was regarded as being a little bit out there uh, I, I, I was acceptable as an op-ed writer for the Times, and I was often on NPR. I think I was on every one of their shows several times. Uh, then I had the bright idea uh, after the 2004 election, what well, was more of a compulsion actually, to uh, dig into that uh, election and write a book about uh, the copious evidence that it had been stolen uh, for Bush Cheney just as their first uh, election had been stolen in 2000. But since the Supreme Court actually um, interceded in the 2000 election vote count, uh, claiming that that election was stolen was not quite as controversial as claiming that the 2004 election was stolen. Now in my naivete and my idealism, I thought and the publisher thought this was basic books in New York, a big publisher, we were all very excited about this book. Uh, we, we thought, again, naively, that it would jumpstart a, an urgently needed national discussion of, of the um, necessity uh, of really radical election reform, which wouldn't be hard to do. We could actually do it now in a moment if, if both the parties, or I should say, if either party was interested in that actually happening. At any rate, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, they were thrilled that the book was coming out. So was I. I hired a publicist to help their publicist. And then uh, to our astonishment, um, the book was on the one hand, almost completely blacked out by the corporate media. Um, you know, despite my record with the Times, they certainly wouldn't review it and no comparable outlet would go near it. Um, there were a total of two newspaper reviews in the whole country. Uh, there was like second string newspapers. And one of those was, was, a, was a hit piece. But that wasn't really as surprising as what happened on the left, the left press. While the corporate media blacked the book out, the left press, for which I'd written for decades, um, attacked the book as conspiracy theory and me as a conspiracy theorist. And that had never happened to me before. I was quite struck. 
not just by the fact that this was from the left I was getting this stuff, but also uh, because this was a new accusation, a new characterization. And I didn't realize it at the moment that it started, but it was a, a permanent change um, that I um, was no longer regarded as, as uh, acceptable in polite society, that I was a conspiracy theorist. So when I got over the shock of this uh, attack from an unexpected quarter, uh, I decided I would research the origins of that phrase, which we all use. Everybody says, everybody uses the phrase conspiracy theory. And people will often say, uh, well, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but, right? And then they'll make a perfectly rational argument. You know, they'll express suspicions that, that make perfect sense and they'll cite evidence that's compelling, but they always feel obliged to apologize for their suspicions. And I wanted to know when and how this happened. So what I did was I, um, I did a search uh, in the archives of the Times, the Washington Post, and Time Magazine, the online archives, on the phrases conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist. And it didn't take long to discover that uh, before 1967, conspiracy theory uh, was used from time to time by the media, uh, not often and in no consistent way, but they did use that. Conspiracy theorist had never been used before 1967. So why did it start then? Well, a, a bit more research revealed that 1967 was the year that the CIA sent a memo to all its station chiefs worldwide. Its uh, ID number is 1035-960. And you can find it, anyone can find it online because uh, it was declassified in a lawsuit in the 70s. Uh, the purpose of this memo, as they announce right at the beginning, is to help them solve the problem they were having with a number of writers who were getting traction, raising questions about the Warren Commission report, okay, it's Kennedy's assassination. So writers like Mark Lane was probably the most offensive to the agency because he was the most popular. His book, Rush to Judgment, was a bestseller. And there were others, three or four other writers who, um, you know, we're traveling the country and talking to readers, uh, giving talks at bookstores and lectures and so on, and making quite clear that the Warren report was completely ludicrous. It doesn't add up at all. Uh, so what was the CIA's plan? The CIA's plan was to get all of its station chiefs globally to use their respective uh, propaganda assets and friends in the media to discredit the work of these writers whom the memo characterizes as conspiracy theorists. And maybe the first time that expression was ever used. Um, and uh, what, they, what they specifically recommended in order to uh, you know, achieve that goal was uh, a number of what we would call talking points that are noted in the memo uh, that, that the station chiefs were supposed to urge on the people writing these attack pieces. And some of them are, are talking points we still hear. Uh, the one that's the most durable is the line, I'm sure you've heard it, uh, well, if there were a conspiracy on such a scale, somebody would have talked by now, okay? You hear this all the time when you talk about 9-11, for example. If you raise questions as to whether 9-11 was actually carried out by these 19 Saudi hijackers, you know, quarterbacked by this um, ailing jihadist in a cave in Afghanistan. And if you propose that actually it, it, there's overwhelming evidence that it was um, managed by the U.S. government for, you know, certain reasons. You, you will often get that response. Well, like they couldn't have done that because somebody would have talked. Uh, now that was in the memo in 67. So they were also using it about the Kennedy assassination. Now there are two problems with that 
I hesitate to call it an argument. It's, it's, it's a propaganda talking point. One is that it is actually possible to uh, conduct a covert operation that involves tens of thousands of people, and you can do it for years without any of them saying anything to a journalist you know, or to judge. Um, we know that that's possible because that's what happened with the Manhattan Project, which went on for years you know, uh, before they finally dropped uh, the A-bombs on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think there were 100,000 people involved in that operation and nobody said a word because if you're operating under military discipline and you also uh, uh, compartmentalize the project so nobody actually knows how the specific work he is doing connects with other things, you can keep a lid on it. Uh, conversely, as it happens, people have talked about the Kennedy assassination People have talked about 9-11, people with some kind of tangential relationship to either conspiracy. And guess what? Uh, many of those people were killed, all right? Uh, that's, that's a pretty compelling reason not to talk, right? So I, 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 I point out these flaws in the logic of the memo just to make clear that it, it was not in any way about uh, mounting a real, um, counter argument to the so-called conspiracy theory. It was not about that at all. Those who call us conspiracy theorists have actually already lost the argument because they call you that not to get people to examine the evidence for themselves and then reject it, the evidence of a conspiracy. On the contrary, they call people conspiracy theorists so that no one will pay attention to what they're saying, see? That's what they must do because they have no arguments to make. They have no evidence to back up their position. Their position has already been uh, demolished by, you know, the likes of Mark Lane and, and or, uh, you know, David Ray Griffin in the world of 9-11 truth and so on. So the purpose of the propaganda is to persuade people to ignore uh, a, a threatening uh, counter narrative. And, and that is, is extremely important for us to understand that propaganda does not want an argument, that propaganda must have its narratives protected at all costs. Uh, it has become increasingly dangerous over the decades since the memo came out to cast a shadow on propaganda narratives. Now, when the memo uh, came out in the late 60s, the takeaway from whatever propaganda, you know, the memo was supposed to um, foster, uh, the takeaway was that conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorists are ridiculous. You know, they're, they're laughable. They wear tinfoil hats. They're, uh, you know, um, barking moon bats. I mean, I could think of many uh, epithets that have been hurled at me over the years, you know. The, the point is that in the 60s and for several decades thereafter, conspiracy theory was kind of a laughing matter. So you were a kook if you entertained these notions. Mark, could I, yeah. could I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. In your research on, on that, on the CIA, uh, did you ever come across the, the Operation Mockingbird? Oh, sure, sure. Could you explain to the audience the Operation Mockingbird and how that helps this conspiracy theorist, how it works? Uh, well, uh, Operation Mockingbird was a formal CIA operation intended to solidify their influence on the American media. Um, if people think that every, every single instance of CIA media manipulation comes out of that operation, and it actually doesn't. Because the CIA really started to manipulate the American press uh, probably right away, as soon as they were formed in 1947, or if not soon thereafter, because that's um, standard operating procedure for intelligence agencies. They all do it. Certainly the CIA has, has done it vigorously and relentlessly all over the world, uh, you know, um, going back to uh, at least the late 40s, you know, when they, they influenced the first uh, election that we know of, which was the elections in Italy in 1948. Um, 
you know, in order to in order to get uh, the American media to, to to carry the point they were making in Italy, they they had to cultivate uh, media outlets and and uh, reporters and you know journalists of various kinds, and they undoubtedly did that, and they did it with probably no pushback to speak of, because you know we came off of World War II very high on the um, victory of the democracies over fascism. And at that time, uh, the intelligence agencies were in very good odor, you know, not just the CIA, but the FBI as well. Uh, and moving up into the 60s, there was a fair amount of propaganda uh, in the American entertainment media that helped explain why people had such a positive impression of both the FBI and the CIA. That positive impression began to fall apart in the 70s uh, when, for a number of reasons, some of the darker doings of the intelligence agencies uh, ended up being reported. Uh, in the 60s, there was a terrific um, leftist or you know, I, countercultural magazine called Ramparts that you guys may remember. Yeah. Did a lot of great, uh, they broke great stories, including the story of how Michigan State University was training, um, you know, police torturers in South Vietnam, you know, uh, that that university was part of the maintenance of the Diem regime in South Vietnam. This was a big scandal. Uh, and it was also ramparts that broke the story of how the National Student Association, which was the biggest student organization in the United States, very liberal, you know, it was opposed to apartheid. It was against McCarthyism. It turned out the CIA was helping to fund the NSA. Now, we may be sort of cynical about this type of thing by now, but back then, it's important to understand uh, Americans were shocked by this because it was a given that uh, the state's covert involvement in civil society was something that the communists did. Okay, it was not something that our government did. So that when um, these pieces appeared in ramparts and then were often, um, they often resonated through the other media. In fact, the New York Times back then was quick to follow up on some of these stories and, and did really excellent work uh, doing so, you know? Uh, so this was, um, this was a shock to people. This is why they persuaded uh, both houses of Congress to form committees to um, investigate uh, the CIA and the FBI. And that's where we got the church committee, which was the better known of the two. That was the Senate committee. Their hearings were actually televised daily, uh, you know, on network TV. And then there was a smaller, lesser known house committee called the Pike committee, um, that, that actually took a harder line with the CIA and tried to do a more critical job than the Senate committee. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to wander all over the place with this. I just want to say that this was a turning point in American public opinion. This is the first time people started to wonder what those uh, agencies were really up to. They have black budgets, you know, especially the CIA. Uh, what were they doing with our tax dollars? And nobody was asking this yet, but indeed, was it just our tax dollars they were using to fund all these operations? I mean, by now we know the CIA has long been involved in the drug trade globally. Uh, you know, the dark side of these agencies' respective histories is is enormous and and quite dark, right? And it was in the 70s that people began to understand that this was the case. Uh, this is all changed now, um, I think primarily because of uh, the Trump presidency. Uh, the um, election of Donald Trump uh, basically made it um, sort of a crime in liberal and progressive eyes to criticize the CIA uh, or the FBI, because we have now been taught by uh, voluminous propaganda that, um, that, that those uh, agencies are protecting us from Putin. Those agencies are protecting us from Trump or were protecting us from Trump. 
So now uh, the same people who once upon a time would have been highly critical of those agencies have now become apologists for them. And then there's other aspects of the story as well. You know, there was a, a vigorous pushback, a kind of a PR struggle by the CIA to uh, prevent these investigations from digging up anything really too destructive, you know? So um, my own experience being called and dismissed, uh, called a conspiracy theorist and dismissed as one, led me to discover this whole history, which I think we have to understand uh, thoroughly uh, now that free speech in the United States and academic freedom are almost dead letters uh, because the tactic of dismissing uh, dissidents as conspiracy theorists has worked like a charm and put a lot of people to sleep. Uh, and I think that the disaster we've been living through the last two years uh, has everything to do with that, with the success of that kind of propaganda. Steve, you got some questions? Uh... Yes, uh, you know, speaking of propaganda, I see that you wrote the introduction to Edward Bernays's uh, classic book written in the 1920s called Propaganda. And uh, I first discovered Bernays uh, by watching a BBC documentary called, um, uh, what was it called? There was a BBC documentary, uh, the, the Age of... Um, what, the Century of the Self? Century of the Self, that's right and uh, found out some very interesting things. And so when I was uh, doing research, I found out that you had written the, uh, the intro. So I'm just curious, this is a little bit prior to your work on Fooled Again and being you know, classified as a conspiracy theorist. What was your interest in propaganda prior to that? And you know, how did, what gave you the authority at that point to write the introduction to such a classic book? Well, by then I'd been teaching courses on propaganda uh, at NYU. You can't really study the media critically without thinking about propaganda at the very least. I, I'm glad you brought that up because um, uh, there's something about that introduction that will enable me to make an important point, which is that, and this is something that anyone who studies propaganda or wants to defend him or herself against it ha has to grasp, you know, uh, that is that um, uh, the impartial study of propaganda requires that you be prepared to move out of your comfort zone. Okay, if you're going to study propaganda honestly and thoroughly, uh, you you're going to have to stand ready to give up some notions that you have held for some time, sometimes fervently held, because you discover that those notions are not your own, that those notions have, have um, been given you or placed in your mind by uh, extremely able propagandists. Nobody has a hard time coming up with examples of propaganda that they disagree with. So if you ask anybody for an example of propaganda, the chances are that they will all point to something that they don't like, right? So a liberal will point to Fox News say that's propaganda. And a conservative will point to the New York Times and say that's propaganda. And they'll both be right. They're right. Fox is propagandistic. Certainly the Times is propagandistic. But the problem is that neither of them is willing to, to concede that uh, the stuff that's influenced them uh, is also propaganda. They, they, they can't do that. I am the last person in the world who will pose as someone who can't be fooled, okay? Academics, I speak about them with some authority because I've been in an academic all my life. Academics are, um, let's say, hampered by and large, and this is mostly people in the humanities and social sciences. They're hampered on the one hand by a complete ignorance of the history of the CIA and, and other such entities. They don't know any of that. It's not gonna do them any good professionally to know that kind of thing or to teach it or write about it. So they don't know it, they're completely ignorant. Therefore, they're, they're that much readier to roll their eyes and snort and jeer 
if you call attention to the possibility that something in that tradition is happening now, right? If you talk about a false flag operation, uh, you know, uh, you will encounter this kind of knee-jerk ridicule because the people ridiculing you don't know the history of false flags, you know, which go back at least to the Spanish-American War. I mean, this is a thing in American history, and not just American history, but imperial history generally, right? So academics don't have any of that background. And being um, arrogant and having advanced degrees, they can't believe that they're capable of being fooled. See, you can't fool them. They're too smart. They have doctorates. They read the New York Times. So they can't be fooled. And whatever they read to get their information can't be propaganda. It has to be the truth. So um, I use myself, I readily use myself as an example of someone who has had to change his views. I changed them about vaccines. I have changed them about climate change. Uh, you know, many things that I believed and believed ardently that I came to discover were uh, groundless, right? And I, I came to that discovery through the critical study of propaganda. You can actually learn a great deal about reality by studying propaganda uh, um, thoroughly. You know, it's interesting. Oh, go ahead, Michael. You had a question. Yeah, let me, I was going to read a quote from Edward Bernays that uh, in his book, uh, he said, it doesn't matter if you're selling cigarettes or war, the approach is the same. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in a democratic society. In other words, he went on arguing that propaganda is the necessary tool for population control in a modern industrial democracies, uh, which is what we're seeing today, information control from the elites. Right. That 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 um, that comes from someone who was a proud progressive, capital P. Right. This is the progressive era. Uh, you know, we 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 the word progressive carries this tinge of like sort of leftism. You know, um, for a number of reasons. But um, it's important to understand the progressive movement was was not uh, uh, devoted to democracy. Uh, the progressive movement was based on a, a, on a notion of democracy, and this is Bernays's notion, as a kind of uh, machine that must be uh, assisted to run smoothly, so that the ideal there is not popular sovereignty, right? It is not um, the people having a say in, in their government. It's about efficiency. It's a managerial ideal of democracy. And this is the same ideal that like Woodrow Wilson believed in and, and many staunch and famous progressives, you know, uh, like Jane Addams and others and W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, the great black intellectual, they were all um, a little bit leery of democracy and uh, inclined to uh, do whatever it might take to make sure that it runs properly and smoothly, despite the kind of oafish illogic of the masses, see? So um, that's where Bernays was essentially coming from. Uh, and he wasn't the only one. I mean, it's easy to demonize him now. Uh, you know, uh, he was extremely good at what he did and, and he understood that propaganda works best and this applies to you know whether you're selling cigarettes or a war. It works best when you don't really see it as such. See, he he had a lot of disdain for advertising. He thought advertising was kind of stupid. Um, that it was unsophisticated because it was announcing itself as a kind of propaganda. So if you see a magazine ad or a poster, you know, or listen to a radio jingle, right? You know, traditional advertising you know that it's propaganda, that it's, it's what they call in the intelligence business, white propaganda. That is, it's propaganda that makes no bones about its being propaganda, right? Like a political speech, for example, or a TV commercial, see? Um, Bernays understood that on the contrary, propaganda has to be disguised as something else. Uh, it has to be disguised as news, has to be disguised as entertainment, see? 
And if it is disguised in this way, then um, people have let their guard down because they don't know that that's what it is that's confronting them. And they tend to believe it that much more readily. So he, uh, you might say, he wrote the book on this kind of um, posture, you know, this pretense of neutrality, uh, right? And, and every good propagandist knows this is the way it works. And this is why uh, the media uh, has so much to um, atone for, to pay for, vis-a-vis uh, -vis these last couple of years, especially, because they have been absolutely key to the um, success of this disastrous globalist operation that we've been living through. Something I want to point out, I was part of the media industry for basically 40 years. I had my own publishing business for 20 years. And one of the things that we came, we started to do was to do advertorials, which is exactly the, what you're speaking about within the industry became advertorial. So people would pay a public publication to write what appeared to be on the surface, total editorial right. promoting their product, their service, whatever it was. Right. Uh, and, that, and that's important for people to understand. And there's a concept that Michael Cratenden, uh, he named a, a phrase called the gel man amnesia effect, which I think is really important to introduce for people because if you're going to try to understand amnesia, uh, propaganda, one of the important things is this concept of the gel man amnesia effect. And what that is, is if you're an expert in some field, let's say, and you're reading something written in, in a leading publication or wherever, and you're sitting there laughing at going, this guy doesn't understand it. He didn't synthesize this at all. This writer really was a numbskull and he really didn't get it. And you think, wow, you know, and you blow it off because you know that this article totally misrepresented the, the facts or the situation because you were an expert in that. Now you turn the page or the next day you get another story from the same publication or the same writer, and now you believe it. Yeah. It's like you just forgot that yesterday's story, these people lied through their teeth to you or totally misinterpreted try, in their effort to synthesize a big issue or facts, but yet you just forget about it and go, oh, here they're telling you the truth. Yesterday you knew they were lying to you, but you just conveniently forgot that. Yeah, it's a good That's point. The amnesia effect that people need to realize that when you when you know when they say I trust our government, I just like to ask them to pay on their age. Well, you still believe that the Gulf of Tonkin attacks on our ships happen? You believe that John F. Kennedy was killed by a lone assassin? That there were weapons of mass destruction? Come on, folks! You think our government wouldn't lie to you? Wake yeah. up! Right, right. Very good point. Absolutely. Yeah, you know that, that reminds me of a of a notion that that I I formulated fairly recently. Um, I, I call it uh, cumulative ignorance. See, <laughs> because think back now, you know, um, on say the Kennedy assassination, right? Now, initially, everybody believed the cover story, and then because of these writers whose work prompted the agency to send out that memo. Um, slowly but surely, um, a majority of the American people came to disbelieve the narrative. And by, by now, it is a ma clear majority of the American people don't believe that Lee Harvey Oswald killed John F. Kennedy uh, by himself or was even involved in it. The New York Times continues to stick to the Warren story. They continue to do that. Now, that seems very perverse, but it actually makes a certain sense because if you, if you let that narrative lie, I use that in two senses, you let it be, and you also let it continue to mislead people, right? Uh, and you don't introduce um, the unaware to the truth about that story. You just let that be. Uh, that will mean one less uh, inducement to start thinking critically about later episodes like that, see? So you, um, you, you, you haven't studied the Kennedy assassination. You don't know anything about it. You didn't see Oliver Stone's JFK, right? Somehow you've managed to keep yourself completely innocent of all this revelation. Uh, then you're readier to believe the official story of 9-11. You're readier to believe the official story of Bobby Kennedy's murder and Martin Luther King's murder and Malcolm X's murder. You're willing to believe that. 
so that um, you know your your prior uh, failure to uh, take due note of an enormous uh, whopper, you know, a, a gigantic big lie. You're having failed to look into that makes you better able uh, to swallow uh, the next one. And the next one, the next and the next one. Now, now I think that we're like, because these last two years have been unique in the history of propaganda for for several reasons. One is that this is a global propaganda, and that's new. Okay, we used to be subjected to propaganda pushed by national governments. This is not national governments. This is a global thing, and it's it was clearly orchestrated on a global level, and it continues to unfold on a global level. It's also unusual in that it is incessant, okay? Formerly, there would be like the Kennedy assassination, and then that whole story would, would, would you know, explode for months and months and through the Warren report and all this. Or we could take it back to World War I, which is the first time that governments devoted themselves to propagandizing whole populations. We look back on these moments and we think of them almost as we would think of uh, kind of a fever or a fever dream, you know, uh, the red scare. I mean, you know, in other words, we think back on these sort of explosive, traumatic episodes of propaganda. They happened, they came to an end, and then people would slowly sort of snap out of it. So after World War I, for example, once people learned that they'd been lied to systematically and on a, you know, a massive scale, uh, they got over their fear and hatred of Germans and German Americans. You know, German Americans were lynched during World War I. I mean, it was really insane. The people got over it. Okay. This has been kind of a nightmare, but I do believe that it is having the salutary effect in a very gradual way, the salutary effect of waking a lot of people up in exactly the way you might just noted. You know, why do you think the government is telling you the truth? Right. Think back on on Tonkin, Gulf of Tonkin. Kennedy says, think of all these things or on Contra. You know, we can go on and on. Well, now the propaganda is so brazen. It is so false. It is so relentless. Uh, it really is so psychotic, you know, that um, it is waking up more and more people. And this is the reason why a key part of the propaganda is to call anyone who proposes any counter narrative, a far rightist, right? The far right, you're on the far right if you question state and media narratives. So I'm on the far right. You read my book titles at the beginning of our conversation, right? The Bush Dyslexicon, Cruel and Unusual, Fooled Again, How the Right Stole the Election, etc. right? The 2004 election. Okay, well now it's uh, the left that's stolen an election in 2020, right? But we're not allowed to say that. You're not allowed to say these things because if you do, you're a fascist, you're an animal, you're a monster, etc. So that whereas, just to finish a prior thought, uh, initially, conspiracy theory was a laughing matter. What's happened since like roughly 2010, okay, since under Obama, basically, is that conspiracy theory has changed. It has been changed from a uh, laughing matter, something that makes you ridiculous, to something uh, very, very dangerous, something that is seditious, something that is terroristic. So now the Department of Homeland Security over the last year or two has said explicitly that if you, if you raise questions about the 2020 election, it's a sign of domestic terrorism. They actually say that. They say, if you talk about 9-11, that's a kind of red flag of domestic terrorism, right? This is serious business. We know from the story, the horrible story of Julian Assange, uh, who was kind of the canary in the coal mine. We know that you do not get away with questioning the prevailing narrative, that this is a real sin, you know? And the odd and disorienting thing for me is, and this is something else that's new about the last two years, it is, it is the left or what we call the left that is primarily driving all this. Uh, well, that's, that's amazing, but that's what's happened. 
it's, now to be, let me just say this last thing, to be on the left seems to mean to people on the left that you've never questioned official narratives, that that is a sign of your leftist virtue. You don't question them. And if you do question them, then you're some kind of, um, you know, mouth breathing redneck, you know? Well, so, um, yeah, th these are really, really uh, striking times. And even though it's a very dark situation, I, I do think that we will ultimately pull through it and prevail. I do too. And that leads me to something that this moral danger of intolerance, the belief that we possess the whole truth causes people to act totally inappropriately, be willing to do all kinds of extreme things to shut people down, dish them, you, you name it, you've experienced it firsthand. The, and that intolerance emanates from the belief that one's position is so right and one's opponents so wrong that it would be catastrophic to respect the opposing viewpoint and any of those who hold it. Right. And today, many of today's so-called leaders argue that the positions advocated by their adversaries are so dangerous that they must be suppressed. And that's what we see all around us going on. And it yeah, is yeah. wrong to grant democratic rights to those global corporatists whose intention is to utilize democracy's tolerance to overthrow it. Today, we have these glo elite globalists, those that are part of what the World Economic Forum that is now coming out very publicly, openly, because of their own belief that they've got such control that they can now begin to talk openly about it. I refer to those people as the Hunger Games Society elites, yeah. whose vision of, of humanity's future is absolutely not one that will lead us to a more beautiful and just world that our hearts know is possible, which is part of the whole point of our show is to help bring forth an understanding so that we can move in that direction. It was one of Hitler's tactics that we're seeing today how they came to power through democratic elections and then used that control that they've got to destroy it. Joseph Goebbels, the former Nazi minister of propaganda in 1928 was famously for saying, we national socialists never asserted openly that we represented a democratic point of view, which is contrary to our people today because that's what they all talk about, it's all democratic. But we declared openly that we use democratic methods only in order to gain power, and that after assuming that power, we would deny to our adversaries without any consideration the means which we were granted to us in the time of opposition. These mm. similar tactics, my friends, are being used today. They are using so-called free and open elections in an attempt to destroy the exact democratic process itself. Many have tried it before, and this is the crossroads we're at. It is now time that we must get our government on the side of the people and out of the hands of these Hunger Games society elites. Yeah, absolutely. We do. Well, I think in, or, in order to realize that dream, um, we're, we're really going to have to um, get past the idea that these corrupted institutions can be reclaimed. I, I, I don't think it's possible to reclaim American journalism through the reform of, uh, you know, the legacy media. I don't think so. I don't think it's possible to reclaim the medical establishment. I mean, it is too far gone. It is too utterly corrupt to be reclaimed. And the same is the case with higher education, right? Which is my area. That's what I do for a living or I try to, right? But it is so corrupt that doing the kind of thing I do only gets you into trouble. I'm not going to tell the whole story of what happened to me. People can go online and find, you know, my GoFundMe page, for example, or uh, there's a um, petition up at change.org. Uh, I mean, one wonders what whatever happened to the uh, ACLU, you know? I mean, you guys are like me, old enough to remember when the ACLU was devoted to free speech, so devoted to free speech that they actually, you know, uh, sided with the Illinois chapter of the American Nazi Party when they wanted to march in Skokie, Illinois, you know, the home of many Holocaust survivors. Well, this was obviously offensive to the ACLU. And for that very reason, they took the side of the Nazis because 
everyone deserves free speech. Uh, you know, free speech isn't based on whether your opinions are acceptable to liberals. Free speech is based on your inalienable right as a citizen of this country, right? So, um, yeah, uh, that's gone now. There still is an ACLU, but it's completely woke now. The ACLU, the last I heard uh, one of their positions, you may remember when some feminists uh, organized a panel discussion at the Seattle Public Library, this is like three years ago, uh, to have a critical discussion of uh, transgenderism and the, and the tension between transgenderism and feminism. You know, that uh, transgender rights is in part about allowing, uh, you know, biological males to compete against females in athletics. It's about allowing biological males into women's shelters and into women's prisons, you know. These are problematic stands, you know. And these feminists therefore wanted to have a public debate about the problem. The ACLU sided with the trans rights people who accused the feminists of hate speech, see? So this is a complete makeover of a once proud and necessary liberal organization that has basically taken a turn into woke fascism. You know, that, that now they believe that you, your free speech rights depend on your agreeing with the rest of us. And if you don't agree with us, you, you shouldn't have those rights. You know, that leads to another question that probably is another hour to answer. We, we don't have that much time. We have uh, 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 about 15 minutes left. But the question is, how did this happen? How did the progressive mind get hijacked by, by these notions? And how did we lose that, that edge of awareness and, and true justice and perspective? That's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, how did this happen? Well, you know, I, I'm struck when I watch um, people on the right, you know, people I now admire to a great extent, like Tucker Carlson and others. I'm, I'm struck and a little put off by their sort of obsessive hammering on the left, the left, the left, the left, the left, the left. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's partly true. That is to say, the people who go in for this kind of thing are now what we call the left and they call themselves the left. But um, there is no way in the world that the Pentagon, for example, is now pushing um, transgenderism. There is no way in the world that Verizon is forcing its, work, its workers to study critical race theory. You know, There's no way in the world that Congress has now um, banned the use of words like mother and father in their own discussions. This didn't happen because the campus left took over the Pentagon. The campus left did not take over Verizon, okay? The fact is that this is an elite agenda and the left has fallen for it. The left has become weaponized uh, as the spear tip for these things, you know, and that, that was something that started, I think, back in the 60s. This is something I'd like to write a book about uh, sooner rather than later, I hope. But the roots of all, excuse me, the roots of all this, the roots of identity politics, which is basically what we're talking about, are in the 60s. When the CIA and its various affiliates were already at work depoliticizing the left and splintering the left dividing the left. The FBI was involved in that as well. The Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, okay, both well-established CIA pass-throughs, okay? The Rockefeller Foundation, both of them continue to do the kind of um, evil work that they've done for decades, right? Well, uh, they were, uh, starting in the late 60s, those two foundations, on which academics largely depend in order to get their research funds, you know, uh, th they started to favor research projects focused on race and gender to the exclusion of class. And they weren't talking about class anymore. And they weren't talking about political economy. They were talking about different tribes, basically outgroups, right? 
so that the whole discourse of the left was completely racialized and genderized, if I can coin a kind of barbarism, right? So it became a matter of which outgroup you were part of. Now, you know, there are certain figures in the academic left, like Herbert Marcuse, who contributed to this, you know, in his theoretical writings. And I think that that has a lot to do with what's happened to the academic left. But I think that it has ultimately been a kind of a psyop, you know, it's been uh, a deliberate and, and albeit gra very gradual uh, process of, of making the left um, increasingly uh, 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 balkanized, you know, splintering it. Uh, it's not enough to be for gay rights now, for example. Um, trans rights is like a separate thing, right? You've got LGBTQ+, plus, right? The rainbow colors and all that stuff. Well, among other things, that is a way to um, overcomplicate a movement and make it, you know, less capable of getting anything accomplished because it's so split up into different stripes or flavors, if you see what I mean. Uh, back in the 60s, the FBI was um, funding Afrocentrists who were uh, deadly enemies of the Black Panthers. Uh, there was Ron Karenga. He was the inventor of Kwanzaa. He's now an emeritus professor somewhere in California. Well, this guy was a kind of an Afrocentrist thug uh, who I think engaged in at least one gun battle with Panthers, I think one or two of whom was killed. Well, you know, this is the oldest trick in the imperial playbook, right? Divide and conquer. That's how uh, the Babylonians did it. It's how the Romans did it. It's how the British did it. And that's how this empire is doing it. You do it by dividing the left and distracting the left and getting the left at, at, at people on the left at each other's throats. That is the surest way to make sure that we're not at the throats of the elite, which is where we should be, right? So to hear Mitt Romney and Bill Gates and Melinda Gates and Nancy Pelosi and Jamie Dimon and Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos saying Black Lives Matter, uh, it, it takes your breath away that anyone on what they would consider to be the left could fall for this, could not see through this as a, as, as a tactic of division, right? But they don't see it. They don't. Uh, it, for some reason, that kind of elite support just makes them double down in their sort of fanaticism. But what we have to do, clearly is, um, you know, make the world over again, to paraphrase Tom Paine. We can't reclaim the left. The left is completely fucked, if I may say so. The left... The you whole, may say so. <laughs> right, thank you. The, the, left, the whole left-right thing is over, okay? It's time to just drop it. People who are talking in those terms, you know, people on the right screaming about the left, people on the left screaming about the right, that makes uh, Bill Gates very happy. It makes Klaus Schwab very happy. It's time to get past this. It's time to stop calling people who believe in freedom rightists. You know, this is extremely perverse. And what it has done is to completely cloud the vision of the so-called left, who are so convinced that Donald Trump is Hitler and that the people who voted for him are brown shirts, that they are incapable of seeing the manifest rollout of overt totalitarianism all around us, even as we speak. I mean, we're here, it's here, you know? Uh, the attacks on free speech, on freedom of assembly, on jury trials, you know, the, the, the COVID moment has been a sustained assault on the constitution, as well as on democracy itself, and, and on science as well, because you can't have science without disagreement. You cannot have science without challenges. That's what science is based on. It is based on challenge. It is based on correction. It is, you know, any scientist worth his salt knows full well that a new theory of his is going to be attacked and questioned by other scientists. They don't take it personally. That's what science is. Well, this whole moment is a moment where uh, science and democracy are both increasingly impossible. So the solution is, it seems to me, for us to break away, to rebuild journalism from the ground up, 
to rebuild the medical establishment from the ground up and to rebuild higher education from the ground up. Mark, and unfortunately, as our time is coming to an end, I want to wrap up with two things. One is, I can't thank you enough. And what you just said to me, the woman who wrote those books and then were produced into the movies, The Hunger Games, that those books were written very specifically to wake up the millennial generation and others to the long-term consequences of the path that we're currently on. We've seen that accelerated. They have pulled back the curtain of that and you've just helped, helped expose that, that Klaus Schwab and the rest of them were talking about. And so I suggest that people think of the Hunger Games and the Hunger Games Society elites to me is the perfect uh, description of those group because of their feigned caring for humanity. That's all it is. But on that note, a couple of weeks ago, you launched an exciting new website called Propaganda in Focus. Mark, could you explain the scope and aim of that? Yeah, sure. I'm on the board of an international uh consortium of scholars called the Operate, um, Organization for Propaganda Study. Uh, there's about five of us. And one of the things we have wanted to do, uh, aside from uh, encourage other academics to study propaganda more systematically and critically, was to that end to um, form a, a new journal and Propaganda in Focus is that journal. I mean, it is a website, but it's a, it's a journal. It runs articles. And its purpose is to not only you know, give academics who want to study propaganda a place to publish, but also um, to run articles that are in sufficiently readable English so that non-academics, civilians, you know, can, can read those pieces with great profit as well. So the first issue came out a few weeks ago. Uh, they asked me, I'm proud to say, to write the lead article, which is all about the COVID moment. And it makes some of the points that you know we've made here today. Um, but we will continue to uh, put this out. It's very, very important. It's it, interesting to note that after World War I, you know, uh, and, and, and not just the war itself, but the immediate aftermath, the early to mid 20s, uh, which saw a number of uh, um, erstwhile participants in the propaganda drive, that is propagandists, were now coming clean. We're now writing magazine articles, basically confessing what they had done. There was a number of uh, pretty interesting pieces in the Saturday Evening Post, for example, which is a very conservative magazine. But there was this really, really interesting and important moment of revelation when um, gradually the British and the American people were clued into the fact that they'd all been lied to on a mammoth scale and with catastrophic consequences. And this began a, a very unusual moment in the history of modern propaganda from like the late 20s through the 30s and right up to the dawn of World War II, there was a really impressive sophistication about propaganda uh, at the mass level. That people understood what it was. They understood it did not just come from the enemy. It had not just come from Germany. It also came from our side. In fact, it was more effective coming from our side. People got this now. And there was, during this aftermath, uh, an organization formed at Columbia University called the Institute for Propaganda Analysis whose goal was you know, to have professors write um, accessibly for a public audience to help a public audience recognize propaganda, which is a really noble effort. They did uh, one very good pamphlet on the sermons, the radio sermons of Fa Father Coughlin, you know, the fascist priest, anti-Semitic priest, uh, basically showing people how his sermons use various rhetorical devices you know, to make irrational arguments, et cetera. Well, when World War II started, of course, the Institute had to be disbanded because when you're at war, you, you can no longer afford the luxury of taking a critical attitude towards propaganda. And this is why George Orwell himself uh, worked on propaganda for the BBC during World War II. And certainly he understood 
how dangerous propaganda was, you know, since years before he wrote 1984. But in wartime, that's what one must do, right? So we're at war again. Uh, but this time, uh, uh, in order for us to prevail in this conflict, this global conflict, where we are all under attack by globalist elites of enormous power, okay? This time, this time, we have to stick with the critical study of propaganda. In fact, this time, we will not prevail unless we do engage in the critical study of propaganda, unless we begin to teach students in high schools and colleges what propaganda is, how to think back against it, how to test its truth claims, right? I think the American people need to become reacquainted with their historic skepticism towards official claims. You know, the American people were never shy about uh, voicing suspicions of elite intentions. Prior to 1967, they had never been shy about that. It goes all the way back to the Declaration of Independence, which is a conspiracy theory from beginning to end. You know, some of it's true about George III, some of it's not. If it were published today, it would probably be laughed at, laughed off as conspiracy theory. The American people were never that worried about seeming crazy if they questioned elite intentions. I would go so far as to say that we cannot have democracy without that suspicion. People who take a very complacent, trusting view of, of elite power uh, don't deserve democracy. They're not capable of it. Okay. So those of us in this country, and other democracies who do believe in that form of government uh, have got to um, stop worrying about somebody calling you a name if you question uh, a, a dominant narrative. It, we, we are obligated to question those narratives, right? Because our survival depends on it. Critical thinking. Steve, would you like to say any last words? Otherwise we're gonna wrap it up here. I think you're muted, Steve. <laughs> you really shed a lot of light on some of the undarkened uh, corridors of power. Uh, and this is what people need to see to wake up. It's waking up is hard to do, as uh, Neil Sadak <laughs> Neil Sadaka didn't quite say that. But waking up is hard to do because uh, it's dangerous. And yeah. it's probably why your faculty, your faculty members went along with the, uh, with the official party line. Uh, to, to protect themselves. People do this all the time. And I think part of this shedding the light is to speak as fearlessly as we can, those of us who are not institutionalized in our institutions. So I, I'm hoping to circulate this interview far and wide. You did a great job, Mark. I'm so glad that you joined us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And, and Mark, again, thank you. The uh, URL for Propaganda in Focus is what? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll publish it on our on our we'll, site. Yeah, and we'll I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, you might as well also let me mention that people can find my own writings on Substack. Uh, so if you want to keep track of what I write, that's a good way to do it. Subscribe to me there, and then I share a lot of um, important news that tends to be blacked out or misreported by the media through my listserv, which is called News from Underground. And you can get those emails by subscribing at markcrispinmiller.com. So those are two different ways that people can keep up with me. Great. Well, thank you again. Okay, if thank you guys. If you're watching Bye. on YouTube or listening on our audio podcast, please subscribe, please like, and of course, please share with your friends and followers. If you would consider becoming a supporter so Steve and I can continue our work and pay our bills and our producer, that would be very helpful and we would appreciate it. And you can do so by going to frontandcenter.us. And that doesn't stand for the United States, it stands for us, frontandcenter.us. Or go search us on Rumble. There you can become a supporter also. Steve and I would be very appreciative of any support you can give. It's only when we the people finally know what propaganda is and how it works, will we be free to not only cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedoms of others. From political battlefields to cooperative playing fields, 
It's a long journey to the more beautiful and just world our hearts know is possible. Let's go there together. Thank you. Thank you for watching.